All right, welcome everyone to the Wayne Theater uh, for our science talk. I'm Tom Benzing. I serve on the board for the Virginia Museum of Natural History, which is one of our sponsors, as well as on the Center for Cold Waters Restoration Board and our South River Watershed Coalition. And I want to thank all three of those sponsors for tonight's presentation together with the Wayne Theater, which is, of course, a great venue here in Waynesboro. And I appreciate those that are in the audience here tonight coming out on a icy evening. Uh, and those of you that are online, I'm glad you could join us and uh, look forward to um, your pres the presentation. Uh, before we get started and before I introduce our speaker for this evening, I do want to bring up Joe Kuiper, who's here and is the executive director for the Virginia Museum of Natural History. And of course, one of the efforts that we're looking at in Waynesboro is bringing a branch campus. So I want to ask Joe to just give us a little bit of a update since our November talk. Thanks, Tom. It's great to see everybody. Uh, again, as, as Tom alluded to, there's probably about 10 times as many people as I thought I would see on a night like tonight, but uh, this is awesome. So to all of you and everyone online, uh, we've had a couple of interesting steps come forward. So you may have noticed in the lot uh, over there next to the uh, uh, South River Preserve, we have a mobile education trailer now, right? So that was the VMFA trailer. One side still says VMFA. That'll get covered up. So uh, all that said, I really want to thank VMFA, my friends over there. They were very kind. Uh, they upgraded uh, this mobile unit. We're going to use it as a stationary outreach post, so to speak, just to kind of get things started here in Waynesboro. We had a nice ribbon cutting last month, uh, installed some of the exhibits that will just give you a teaser of what we're going to bring here to uh, Waynesboro when we build our branch campus uh, on the municipal lot at the corner of Arch and Main. So we have a little more, more work to do, and our intention is to be fully ready to uh, present to the public uh, at this upcoming River Fest on April 27th. So look for us there. It should be a, a kind of a cool thing. We'll have some staff. We'll have some exhibits that are pertinent to the Blue Ridge and Piedmont, as well as other areas of Virginia. So we're looking forward to that. I will also say that we are hard at work, and uh, we are you know, convincing our friends in the General Assembly that we are ready uh, for funding and to start to break ground. That said, it is not too late for you to thank your local delegate and your local senator. If you're right here in Waynesboro, that would be Delegate Ellen Campbell and Senator Chris Head. Uh, they are hard at work uh, in this current General Assembly session uh, looking to move funds towards us. We are in the state's six-year capital outlay program. In fact, we are a priority one project so we are at the front of the line. Now it's just a matter of when the levers are pulled that we can get the cash to go and break ground. So any kind of outreach that you can do, reaching out to these folks and letting them know you're still behind us and uh, you know, uh, our effort here to bring this project to fruition uh, would be appreciated. So Tom, thank you for the opportunity to update everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. So tonight, um, I'm happy to welcome to the stage Dr. Amy Riscasi, who I had a chance to work with because in my role with Trout Unlimited, I also helped to coordinate some of the volunteers for the uh, sample gathering that she'll be talking about. Amy is a research, senior research scientist in the Department of Environmental Sciences at the University of Virginia and the project coordinator for the Shenandoah Watershed Study as well as the Virginia Trout Stream Sensitivity Study. Amy earned both her master's in environmental engineering and PhD in environmental sciences from UVA and has worked in several national parks and with the US Geological Survey in Air and Water Resources Management. Her talk tonight is titled, The Past, Present, and Future Water Quality of Virginia's Native Trout Streams. Please join me in welcoming Amy to the Wayne Theater stage. Thanks everyone for showing up on a cold night. Uh, it was nice to come over the Afton Mountain and see the, uh, the snow in the valley. So I appreciated coming over here. Um, so I'm just going to start right into my talk, give you kind of an outline first of what we're going to go over today. So I will start out just giving you uh, a little bit of background of Brook, Brook Trout Stream Habitat. You all may know more than I about that. 
uh, and then go over the kind of the history of atmospheric pollution, specifically acid deposition, and just some basic concepts about how we understand uh, how it moves through our ecosystems, and that will help you basically to understand the rest of, uh, of the talk a little bit better. And so I will step through uh, the title, and I'll start with the past, kind of talk about the stream monitoring program that kind of allows us to understand what's going on uh, in the streams in this region, and then talk about initial findings uh, when the programs were started uh, about 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, and we'll talk about stream chemistry, and I know fish is of uh, interest to a lot of you here, so we're gonna tie those two together in, in, uh, in each step. Uh, then I'll talk about the present, kind of what the status is, what we've seen with respect to air pollution and stream chemistry and fish, um, give you a little report from the, the survey Tom was talking about, the Virginia Trout Stream Sensitivity Study that does statewide sampling every 10 years, um, and then talk a little bit about what the future may hold uh, concerns, projections, um, and then kind of step through a couple of um, potential impacts in the future related to disturbance that we've actually seen in the past, so trying to kind of understand the future by, by seeing what's happened previously. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to briefly mention, you guys may know about it since it's kind of in your backyard, that Meadow Run is planned to be Lyme, the watershed. Uh, in the coming year, and so I just wanted to let you know how we're involved in that um, and point you to some resources if you had more questions about it. Okay, so very general background. When I, the title, you know, just says native trout streams, so we're talking about brook trout here. So in the eastern U.S., this map on the right, uh, I took from the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture website, but it's showing you kind of a historic distribution of where brook trout are. Um, and some key characteristics, it's the only native trout to the, much of the eastern U.S. Uh, what does it need? It needs cold, clear water. Um, and a decline in brook trout populations can serve as an early warning that there's something wrong with your system. So the map on your right is also from the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, and that's showing um, the current dis distribution of brook trout stream patches so you can see I've got a little box there around our region. Um, so we can see is the, where the, the remaining brook trout streams are in the southeast are these high elevation headwater streams that is your backyard um, located on public land. So if you look at the coloring on that map, you're probably noticing it, it lines up pretty well with Shenandoah National Park boundaries and George Washington Jefferson National Forest. Those are the majority of the locations um, where the brook trout still remain. So, right, so the question is, you know, we're not, we're not uh, putting animals in the stream, we're not dumping nutrients into agriculture that's making it into the stream. So what is the, the danger? What is gonna change the chemistry of these high mountain streams that seem fairly protected? They're on protected lands. You're not paving over them. Okay, so what, what could impact a headwater stream? Okay, so the main one I'm going to be talking about today is, is pollution from atmospheric deposition, so acid deposition. So on the, on the right, the photograph you see there is an uh, atmospheric deposition monitoring station that's located in Shendo National Park. If you guys have been to Big Meadows, if you hunt around back there, you'd eventually bump into uh, this station. So, you know, we've under, we, the park and um, the natural resource managers understand that one of the bigger threats to the system is, is things that we can't control that's coming from the atmosphere. And so they've been monitoring the change in precipitation chemistry uh, and other things uh, since the early 80s. Some other things that can impact the watershed that's gonna have an impact on the stream, um, something like an invasive insect that defoliates or kills the vegetation. For those of you who've been around a while, you remember the early 90s, I think this picture is from this region where the gypsy moth, called the spongy moth now, um, basically decimated huge, huge swaths of the forest, and we know that had implications for stream chemistry, right? Different types of precipitation events have an impact on stream chemistry. This picture on the right is Payne Run, just up the road during Hurricane Florence in 2018, so we know how, how and when the water uh, levels change impacts stream chemistry, and then fire, uh, right? That's something else that impacts the watershed that has an impact on stream chemistry. So this is actually a picture from the east side 
Quaker Run wildfire, which was just past November. So all of these things that happen to the watershed on protected lands um, can have an impact on the chemistry. And so we'll kind of step through these things and talk about them today. Uh, but before we even uh, get into the impact, we, it's good to know what's normal. Okay, so if you think about the chemistry of a stream pH, right, how neutral or acidic is it, with seven being um, neutral, sorry, alkaline or acidic. Um, and so seven is neutral, and what is normal for a stream? It's gonna be slightly acidic uh, because precipitation is slightly acidic because of just natural carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So you end up 6.5 to seven is, is a very normal neutral range, and so this image on the right is just showing you that 6.5, you got uh, all different types of species present, and as you step down uh, lower numbers in the pH scale, more acidic, you, you start to lose species. Okay, so I wanted to take a minute to talk about how, how uh, humans discovered that acid rain was a problem, because I always think it's really interesting that it was the fishermen, right? It wasn't some chemist measuring rain chemistry uh, in his lab, it was the fishermen who noticed in, Nor in southern Norway, they noticed the populations were declining, right? And they eventually traced it back to being near uh, industrial area and that the precipitation chemistry had become more acidic. And so this is actually from a paper from um, that location. It was in the 70s that it was published and on the graph, on the right, you're showing the, a decline in their um, salmon population in, in an acidic uh, river and then kind of a straight line in rivers that weren't impacted by industrial pollution. So just always think it's, you know, different, different eyes need to be on the stream for people to notice what's going on. Um, as far as the U.S., so that was kind of the, I think in the 20s, people anecdotally started seeing problems, and then the 50s, it started to be studied. And similarly, in the 50s in the US, it started the, the impact of acid precipitation on streams and watersheds was um, studied in New Hampshire. That was kind of the first, the first research that went on. And so again, this is a paper that came out in 1974 um, stating that acid rain was a problem. And the authors are Gene Likens in uh, Herbert Borman. Okay, so talked about industrialization, uh, acid deposition, and fish. So now I'm just gonna take you through how they're all connected. So that'll help you understand the rest of the presentation. So fossil fuel combustion, right? We hear a lot about CO2. Carbon is part of coal. Well, so is sulfur, uh, nitrogen, mercury is in there too. And so when you burn it, so when you burn coal, you increase the amount of sulfur dioxide you put in the atmosphere, as, as well as other things, including nitrous oxides, right? It combines um, with water, dissolves, uh, the gas dissolved in water in the atmosphere becomes sulfuric or nitric acid, and eventually, right, it's gonna come down uh, in our watersheds and deposit to the landscape and make its way down to the soils. So the soils uh, have um, natural elements present, so there's cations like magnesium and calcium. There's also uh, carbonates, so we use the term A and C here, that means acid neutralizing capacity. You can think of it like a natural Tums, so it's something that can um, neutralize an acid. And then there's aluminum, it's kind of hard to see there, the red. So that's um, a metal that usually stays in the soil. So what happens is when you your dry or wet precipitation adds these uh, acidifier, so you've got sulfate and hydrogen, it decreases the pH of the soil and the soil water. And when that happens um, and water now moves through the system, it actually carries through and brings um, these acidifying uh, sulfate in the hydrogen ion, those ions into the stream, it decreases the pH in the stream, it also brings that aluminum in because the pH is now so low that that uh, mobilizes it. So there's a couple things going on um, that are detrimental. The pH decreasing and then the aluminum coming to the stream. Fortunately, there are some things that can offset that impact. Uh, that's shown in green. I talked about it uh, in the beginning. It's the base cations and that 
as a neutralizing capacity. So if you have enough of that, right, that can offset um, the impact of the acid deposition. So these are kind of the basic terms I'm gonna talk about in, um, throughout the presentation. So the one other kind of main point uh, I wanna talk about is changes in flow and how that impacts what is uh, brought to the stream from the soil. So if you think of the sources, right, we've got the neutralizing sources that can help, um, help the system not become more acidic, and that's coming from the bedrock. So depending on what kind of bedrock you have, what it's made up of, how well does it weather, that's gonna influence um, what's in the soil. And in general, the lower soil is gonna have more of those than way up top, because that's where it's coming from. And similarly, when you have the acidifying compounds coming from the atmosphere, you're gonna have more of them, initially at least, in the upper part of the soil. And so there's kind of a gradient. So what that means is, uh, when the water is just kind of base flow, right, it's not right after a storm like we've just had, it's just kind of lower flow, um, you're gonna get more of a, a neutralized uh, water. You're gonna get more of those base cations and, and neutralizing um, carbonates. But when you have a precipitation event, uh, like we've had this past week, and you now are getting water from uh, precipitation, and now you've got, the water is now higher up in the soil. Um, what that means is that you're now mobilizing more of those things that create acid conditions. So in summary, what that means is when you go from low flow to high flow, you're mobilizing more um, acid anions, so the salt, uh, sulfate here. Your base cations go down because you're you're getting soil water from uh, higher in the soil uh, column, and your pH goes down. So what that is called is basically episodic acidification. So you have your kind of normal baseline condition, but then when a um, storm comes through, you're mobilizing um, things that are gonna make the stream more acidic. So it's kind of short transient events, and I'm gonna show you an example of what this looks like uh, in subsequent slides. Okay, so that's the water, but you guys, a lot of you I already know are fishermen, so you might wanna say, well, how does that impact the fish? What, what does it do? So um, having a stream that becomes more acidic is negative to both developing fish and adult fish. So here, this is research done by other folks, I'm not a fisheries biologist, but that has, uh, in the laboratory, when they studied the impact of uh, fish, pH, stream pH on fish, they found that by lowering the pH, you get abnormal development um, of your little fry, right? So it's, it, it, it causes a problem with normal development. And then even if you're an adult fish, you can't necessarily handle those conditions because both the hydrogen ions and the aluminum that's in the stream screws up basically the gill's ability to, um, to, to bring in oxygen and it dis disrupts the salt water balance in the blood, which I have heard as um, being characterized as it's, it's almost like the fish is having a heart attack because the, 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 um, it became, comes too hard to pump, uh, pump blood, it becomes thick. And so there's a couple mechanisms, but either way, um, pH is gonna have a negative effect, low pH is gonna have a negative effect, effect on uh, developing an adult fish. Okay, so that was the summary. It was a, a little bit long, but uh, hopefully it'll give you the information you need to, to uh, process the rest of the talk. Um, so what I'm showing you here now is we're talking about the past. So what has happened with respect to emissions of these compounds we know become uh, acidifiers to our stream system. So you can see the sulfur dioxide and the nitrous oxides in both these graphs, right, are increasing after the turn of the century because we are burning more fossil fuels with the Industrial Revolution. Um, the other message here is historically, so this is some graphs from the 80s that were derived from those NEP stations like we have in Shenandoah National Park, but around the US. So what you can see is that red color there, that's indicating there's more um, acid deposition in those regions, the darker the red, the heat map. Uh, and the reason is, right, location. So. Coal is in, a lot of the coal seams are in the Ohio Valley. You're gonna burn the coal where you find the coal, and so you end up having a regional hotspot, and we're downwind of that hotspot, and so we are also um, encountering those uh, conditions, right? This is not a California problem, this is an East Coast problem. Okay, so 
the basics on the problem, so now how we have come to understand, especially the Virginia uh, local stream systems um, was begun, the data collection was begun back in 1979. You guys might know White Oak Run, um, not too far from here, just a couple of watersheds north, or one watershed north of Payne Run. So in 1979, Jim Galloway, who may be listening tonight, um, started the Shendell Watershed Study Program. He had actually come from doing research up in Hubbard Brook in New Hampshire where the early work was done, and he wanted to start looking at the southeastern United States because no one had paid attention to this region yet. And he paired up with a hydrologist, so George Hornberger is on the right. He used to also, these are both UVA professors, young professors back in the 70s. Um, and so they started a monitoring program to look at both stream flow and water chemistry at that time in, in White Oak Run, and I think Deep Run was the other one. And so the, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how this program has expanded uh, over time and what we're measuring and what we've learned. Okay, so this, this is showing you basically what types of uh, data or what locations we've been collecting data over time. So. I mentioned, uh, right, 1979, they had one or two sites, but they knew, you know, two sites out of how many, there's a whole bunch of sites in, in Virginia, you know, are we really learning what we need to know from two sites? And so what they decided was to do um, a survey of all the streams that they knew to be brook trout streams. And so at the, in the uh, mid 80s, the Virginia, what was then called the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, had just, and Paul Bugis, if anyone knows him, he used to be the fisheries um, biologist there, actually had started mapping all of the brook trout streams. And so UVA scientists in collaboration with them and Trout Unlimited volunteers uh, to do the legwork started sampling every single brook trout stream that wasn't impacted by something um, such as uh, some, something man-made uh, to, to try to understand what the impact was of acid deposition occurred. And that survey, uh, has happened every 10 years, the most recent being in 2021, and I'll show you some of the results from that in this talk. Um, but what that survey allowed was the scientists to say, okay, we're not gonna sample 450 streams every year, or four times a year, but we'll pick a subset, right, that represent a whole range of conditions. And so that program became kind of the quarterly VTSSS study. So on the right, upper right, you can see there's about 68 streams that have been sampled since 1988, to present four times a year. So that helps us to understand regionally what's going on uh, through time. So now if you step down to the lower right, that's Shenandoah National Park. So just letting you know that of those quarterly sites, we've got 15 in the park. And of those 15, if you go now to the uh, lower left, we have uh, four that are sampled weekly. So we have someone, someone was out today sampling White Oak Run um, and Payne Run. Um, and, and then of those four, three have episodic sampling, right? So that actually means when there's a big storm event, we have a trigger to say, hey, sample, sample when we have these little short-lived storms so we can see what the conditions are because they're harder to, um, you wouldn't necessarily be out there at the right time otherwise. So we have a whole system um, of distributed sites at different frequencies to try to help us understand what's going on uh, in these streams. And what do, we, what do we analyze when we collect a sample uh, of the stream water? So there's different, um, we have a laboratory at the University of Virginia in this picture, not looking at the camera is our main analyst, Susie Maben, who's also been here since the 90s. So we look at pH, A and C, um, base cations I mentioned before, and the acid anions. So everything we kind of talked about earlier we know is relevant. The two that are in yellow are ones I'm gonna actually be showing you data from. So it's that sulfate, which we know is the main acidifier, and that ANC, which basically tells us how well the system is neutralizing the acids. We also measure stream flow on four, uh, four different sites in Shenandoah. And then biological evaluations are, in the early days of the project, in the early 90s, um, UVA did have a fish biologist who did some population surveys and then uh, there was a repeat of some of those surveys pretty recently in 2016. That was done by Dr. Christine May, if any of you know her at JMU, and her student Pat Harmon. Um, and then Shenandoah National Park has an INM program, so they do periodic, uh, kind of every other year, fish population surveys. So I'll, 
I'll show you some data from, from these projects to connect the chemistry to the fish. Okay, so now we're starting with actual data. So on the right, you can see Shenandoah National Park. And so the thing you're gonna notice is that there's three main colors. And so the park here is color coded by bedrock. So there's three different types of um, bedrock in Shenandoah. Kind of we have a mafic and then um, felsic and siliciclastic. Other terminology you might hear basaltic, granitic quartzite. And so what they, uh, they're very distinct in what they're the amount of base cations um, that they're composed of and how weatherable they are. So those mafic sites, so if you've ever been up north at Piney River, it's underlined by, underlined by um, this mafic or very weatherable bedrock. It's gotta have a lot of that ANC I talked about. Whereas in this region, the southwest, it's specifically the quartzite. So it's very weather resistant. It doesn't have a lot of ability to neutralize the acids. And so what that means is even though the acid deposition is kind of similar throughout the park in the region, the response of the watersheds is very different depending on what bedrock it has. So these colors correspond to the three sites we sample weekly. So Piney River, Stan River, and Payne Run. Uh, and so we can see as they group. So Piney River that has bedrock that's very weatherable has high ANC. So sorry, that's on the x-axis here, right? And has pH around seven. You look at the watershed Payne Run down in the southwest that we know has um, weather resistant bedrock, you have ANC close to zero and then you have pH in the five to six. So it's much more acidic. So that's showing us the uh, importance of the bedrock in controlling the response to acid deposition. Okay, so what about fish? So one thing that these surveys uh, monitor are the number of fish species present. And so if you if uh, back in the 90s, the UVA um, did surveys at 13 streams in Shen, including the three I just showed you data from, and they looked at the relationship between that A and C value and the number of fish species present. And so what you're seeing here is that those low uh, A and C streams, right, the Southwest that have siliciclastic bedrock also only have, you know, one to three fish species. But you move up to the other, um, places where the ANC is higher, um, you've got a lot more diversity present. And what about brook trout? Okay, so I should note brook trout um, actually are fairly tolerant of acid conditions. So those streams where you only see one or two fish species present, brook trout are there. They're, they're kind of the last ones to standing when things become acidic. Um, but despite their presence, they're less abundant. So they're there, they're at these, these sites in this region, but they're not as abundant, at least in the early 90s, as they were, as they are at other sites that have higher ANC. Okay, so I mentioned earlier a little bit about episodic acidification. So I want you to look at the graph I just showed you before. So, but just look at the, this is Payne Run. So you can see there's quite a, a range in pH for one site, there's six to five. And so what's driving a lot of that change is flow. So I mentioned before, when you have low flow, you tend to have more buffering capacity. Um, when you get to high flow, you get more uh, acidifying agents come into the stream. And so that is what we're seeing uh, here. If you wanna kind of look at it over time, so this is showing you flow in the stream. And then you can see right, a rainfall precipitation event comes in, you guys know that goes up really quickly and comes down pretty quickly here on the order of hours, maybe a day. And when that happens, you get a really, really quick decrease in pH, right? Change in condition. And then this was uh, data from the 90s when they were looking at egg fry survivorship. And so everything's going along fine. And then you get one little rain event that drops your pH and then you've lost your, your age class. So, so we know that there's both kind of impact of, of chronic conditions that are acidic, and there's also um, an impact on these very brief, uh, highly acidic episodes. Okay, so that's the past. So that's a snippet of the, of the research that, that has helped us to understand what the impact of acid deposition has been. Um, and all of that science and much, much more helped to foster the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. So there's the first George Bush signing the um, act. 
and basically it established a approach to reducing those emissions, the sulfur dioxide emissions. And it has been a very successful program. So what I'm showing you on this top graph, uh, you saw earlier, I showed you this before up until about this point. So the sulfur dioxide emissions in the US were going up. The Clean Air Act amendments are right here, and you can see the drop over time is pretty, it's been pretty substantial, I think over 90% uh, reduction. And the little blue dots in this graph are showing you every time we had a decadal survey that um, Tom was talking about earlier, where we have a statewide survey, and that'll, that'll come into play later. But, um, so we've been monitoring streams uh, throughout this whole decline in acid uh, emissions. And I, I just want to show you a quick um, graph that is showing Shenandoah National Park. I mentioned they have a NADP station that measures acid precipitation. And so I just wanted to show you the, you know, this is US emissions, but that's also the same is true for um, sulfate in deposition. So this is uh, a graph from 1980 to present, because that's when the station started. So you can see the decline, not just in emissions, but in deposition. Uh, and just because pH is kind of more intuitive, this is one way to look at uh, how rainwater has changed over time. So back in the, the 80s, rainwater pH was maybe 4.4, 4.5, and today we're closer to 5.5. And so there's been a, in, a huge uh, increase in pH um, in, in uh, recovery from decreasing uh, fossil fuel emissions. Okay, so now that we know, right, we've, we've learned what was going on, we've implemented ways to fix the problem as much as we can, we know that we've seen declines in deposition, but at the end of the day, we wanna know what's going on the, in the streams, right? Are they responding the same way, um, slower, faster? And so when we, we know the, the whole east, kind of northeastern US is where um, acid deposition was a problem, so this is showing you a variety of sites throughout um, the eastern US where streams have been monitored over time. And so periodically we try to do an assessment of how um, things are changing throughout this region. And one thing I do want to note is there is a distinction between kind of the north and the south. And that is the last time the glaciers came through here, they stopped uh, north of us here, somewhere in Pennsylvania. And so what that did was it changed the soils. So the north that had a glacier come in and scrape, scrape the soils clean, they're, um, they're younger, they're thinner, they're rockier. Our soils here uh, in Virginia and further south of the last glacial extent, they're thicker, they're older, and one of the characteristics they have is they absorb sulfur. So basically you can think of it as a sponge. So you're, you're putting that um, sulfur into the system but it's not necessarily going to come out right away, right? It's being, it's kind of stuck to the soil, you can think of it as. Okay, so the graph I'm showing you here is uh, looking at the amount of sulfur that's coming in versus going out so of a watershed. So what you can see is the blue, uh, which represent the southern sites, southeast, are much, uh, they're pretty high up above the zero line, and that means they're retaining sulfur. So that means a lot's coming in and not a lot's going out. The northeast, because it can't hold on to that sulfur, it's always kind of hovering around zero. Um, the other important note is that we did cross over more in the past decade, which is good. That means we're starting to get rid of it uh, from our watersheds. So another thing, to, another way to look at this data set in if um, fluxes don't really make sense to you, is just how have the concentrations in the stream changed, right? Do we have more sulfur, less sulfur? Um, how is the ANC? And so I'm gonna show you a, a graph uh, that's coming from, again, a distribution of sites from the northeast to the southeast. And you can see these are all the quarterly sites I mentioned earlier, those 66 sites that are sampled four times a year are part of that study. Uh, this is an EPA program. And so if we look at the trends in the stream water in all these sites, we kind of group them by region. You see New England, Adirondacks, uh, Northern Appalachians. You see these bars are showing you uh, declines in the sulfate, which is good. We want to see declines. But Virginia, 
right? We're not, we're not keeping up with everyone else. And that the reason is uh, because we're retaining sulfur. So we're slowly getting rid of it. It's not, it's not kind of an in and out thing. So just because your deposition is much better, you still have that legacy sulfur in the soil. And kind of similarly, if you look over at the graph on the bottom right, you see A and C is improving um, in the Northeast. And then you can see that we kind of span the good and the bad, right? So we're seeing um, some improvement, but not across the board. Okay, so now let's kind of zoom in on Virginia, right? We, we know that we're distinct from the Northeast, but we, we think we know why it has to do with our soils, um, that we're gonna be recovering slower. But even within Virginia, you know, are, are things recovering at the same rate? We know the bedrock uh, is different throughout Shenandoah and the whole um, region where we have brook trout streams. And so this, I'm gonna show you um, data that covers um, the, the the map I'm showing you color-coded accordingly. So the siliciclastic sites are gonna be in red, uh, and then the mafic sites are gonna be in blue. And so this is just looking at some trends for that acid neutralizing capacity I talked about. So what you're seeing is positive numbers for certain colors and then more negative for, uh, for the red. And so the blue are sites that were kind of doing okay anyway so the fact that they're recovering or improving in their, their neutralizing uh, capacity is good, but it doesn't really um, help the systems that are more acidic, right? Those systems are even slower to recover. The right, another way to phrase it, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. So we're having a difference in recovery even locally. Okay, so I also mentioned flow being important. So we know that you have, you can have episodic, episodic acidification. And so we all wanted to know, okay, has that been changing? Um, we can, the grab samples that we take periodically, they typically reflect kind of the base flow conditions, not a storm event, because they're so hard to uh, capture. So I'm gonna show you a graph now showing you differences for flow of changes in that acidifying compound at sulfate in the stream water. And so, Anything that's going down is negative, and that is good because that means we're having declines. So what you can see is low, low kind of moderate stream flow conditions. This, there's not much change going on, if any. But once you get to high flow, you actually are seeing declined, which is good, right? So even the site like Payne Run, where it looked like there wasn't any improvement when we looked, you know, at samples taken four times a year. If we actually look at our high flow samples, we can see that things are improving. And so another way to look at it, if you're a fish in the water, um, so back in the 90s, if you were swimming around and the pH was six and a storm came through, you could drop a whole pH unit, right? That becomes very acidic very quick. If you move to present day, uh, or the 2015-ish, um, your, your base condition is still the same, but it doesn't drop as much, right? So that's telling us that that episodic acidification is improving, even if kind of the base, baseline conditions aren't. And that's, that's positive. That's something that we, we wanna see. Okay, so what about the fish, right? You can tell, I can talk all I want about chemistry, but is it, is it having an impact? Is there a recovery or lack thereof associated with the fish? Okay, so this I'm showing you, I'm gonna, should have you look at the graph on the right first. So this is showing uh, changes in that A and C metric. So the bigger the positive number over here, the better, uh, the better the change has been over time, the more improvement. So I mentioned before, it's the basaltic streams where we're actually seeing um, increases in A and C. And then on the Y axis, that's um, the difference in fish species richness between the early 90s and the, the teens. Um, and what you're seeing is there really isn't much change for the siliciclastic and granitic sites where there's not much change in chemistry, but where we are seeing uh, increases in A and C, we're bringing in new species. And so this was, um, again, Christine May's work from JMU and Pat Harmon. And on the left, I'm not sure if you can see it, but this is actually showing you the new species that have come into those sites. So, so the sites where we're seeing improvements in the chemistry, uh, we are bringing in new species. 
So the other thing to look at, we talked about just abundance of brook trout. So the graph on the lower right, this is based on data collected by Shenandoah National Park. But what you're seeing is abundance um, over a period of about 14 years. And what you're seeing is there's an increase, an increase in abundance of brook trout. And that's happening at the siliciclastic sites, right? The low pH sites. The sites that have the kind of neutral pH, we're seeing improvement in ANC. We're not seeing much change at all. And so what this is pro could be tied to, right? The sites where we're seeing more brook trout are the sites where episodic acidification is improving, right? So we're seeing kind of different results at different places that seem to be aligned with the chemistry. So we're seeing more brook trout at the sites in this region in the Southwest, uh, which may be tied to places where we're also seeing less acidic episodes from storms. Okay, so that was um, the most of the, the kind of detailed uh, data from the um, more frequently sampled sites. Uh, I also want to show uh, a graph from, or graph or two, from the decadal survey, right? So it's only four points in time. We've had um, 87, 2000, 2010, and 2021, um, but it does represent the vast majority of streams in Virginia. The graph on the right is showing you kind of the breakdown of who sampled where as far as uh, VPSSS chapters. So if you were part of that survey effort, thank you. Um, and just a brief cap. So Tom was the, um, or sorry, brief summary. Tom was the uh, uh, state trout and limited coordinator for this effort. There were 13 TU chapters plus two counties. Um, every chapter sampled about 12 to 45 sites. So we had a total of 454 sites sampled. So it was a lot, uh, a big effort. And I've done other presentations just focused on this, but today I'm just gonna show you um, one or two uh, graphs. And before I show you the graphs, I do wanna let you know that, um, so that ANC number has been tied to kind of a brook trout response category to make it kind of simpler to interpret. So if you see an ANC number above 50, that's considered suitable, all else being fine for uh, a brook trout. If you start getting lower than that, you have uh, intermediate and marginal uh, quality, and anything below zero is considered unsuitable and habitable. So what I'm gonna show you is just some graphs from these statewide surveys that divvy up the sites based on uh, these four categories. So, so back in 1987, you had about 58% of the sites sampled in Virginia um, that were suitable. And we had about 5% that were unsuitable, right? And then somewhere in between uh, the remaining about 35. So the next three decadal surveys, what you can see is two things. One is not a lot of change, but it is moving in the right direction. So we are seeing more sites with suitable habitat over time. Um, and we're seeing the worst uh, unsuitable habitat sites decreasing over time. But maybe the most important message is that, you know, we're still seeing the effects of acidic conditions in these systems. We're not, you know, you can say the problem acid rain is solved and the fact that deposition has come down, but we're still dealing with the legacy in this region. Um, and so you can't ignore it when we think about the future because it's still here. Right? It hasn't moved through the system and now we get to look at the next threat. This is one of the threats that is maintained in the future. Okay, so now we're on the future part of the talk. Um, so you saw the black line before, that's the sulfur dioxide emissions in the US in that really nice decreasing line. Um, at the same time, right, the CO2 concentrations are going up and that has implications for um, lots of things. But if we think about brook trout specifically, um, its actual name reflects its vulnerability. And um, I took this little snippet of information, if anyone knows Dawn Kirk, she's the fisheries biologist for the Forest Service that we work with. Uh, she pointed me to the, uh, when I asked her about good literature about brook trout in the future, she pointed me to something that, that highlighted the fact that what they need is cool, clear water. Um, and so cool being the, the word I'm gonna focus on right now, 
So right, so the thing that fishery scientists uh, in particular are looking at are temperature and what is going on in the streams. Um, so increasing stream temperature can be caused by increasing air temperature, that's kind of obvious, um, but also a decrease in stream shading. So if you guys might know, uh, recognize the hemlock and the wool, the wool from the woolly adelgid. I know I've talked to fishermen at some of my talks who said their fishing uh, spot was hemlocks, and then when the hemlocks left and the shade left, the fish left, right? So there are several things that it can affect um, stream temperature, but shading being uh, a key one as well as air temperature changes. Okay, so some fisheries folks have thought a little bit about this, and so scientists like to project into the future. So there have been, um, there was actually a nice study that considered for the first time, not just temperature, but that temperature as it increases downstream is gonna drive the fish up, but they're still, drive the fish upstream, but they're still limited, right? We still have legacy effects from uh, acid deposition in this region. So what we're doing is we're squeezing them. We're giving them less habitat um, in the future. And so the, the amount of cold water habitat is gonna decrease with every uh, increase in air temperature. Um, I also like to point out that it's not quite as simple as air temperature increases and water temperature increases. So the US Geological Survey and the National Park Service are doing uh, temperature studies in watersheds. And what they find when they look at air and water temperature is that there's a a lot of uh, variability. So some, as far as them tracking each other. So this is a site, uh, black is air temperature and that gray is water. They track each other really well, right? So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. You go to another site and water temperature is totally separate from air temperature variability, right? That's a groundwater influence. So it's not, uh, I just wanna say, you know, it's not, it's not, um, quite as simple as looking at air temperature and inferring what's happening with the, the stream. So it's, um, but it's certainly a focus of uh, uh, research right now is to understand how t air temperature impacts stream temperature and what that does for stream habitat. Okay, so the other thing we th when we think about changes in the future, um, the potential for more disturbance or more frequent watershed disturbance. So because we have been monitoring streams during um, disturbances in the past, I mentioned a few of them, we can kind of project on what might happen in the future if these episodes become more frequent. So one, there's three things I'm gonna mention. One is um, increased rates of insect defoliations, which may cause tree mortality. Um, maybe we might end up getting more fire if we have more extreme drought conditions. Um, and then just changes in precipitation patterns, meaning more extreme floods. Okay, so what happens when you have a major defoliation event like we did in the 90s? So this is data from White Oak Run. So what you can see is the 90s is where the gypsy moths came in. So if you look before that, this is nitrate concentration. We haven't talked much about nitrate because it's usually very low in these streams, uh, but nitrate like sulfate is an acidifier. So when you come in and then you defoliate your trees uh, and they're not taking up nitrogen, what you see is an increase in the stream. So right, defoliation is gonna put more um, acidifying compounds in the stream. So that's something to be aware of. If you have more of these events in the future, um, you may be getting more acidifying compounds in your water. And this is a very big uh, table just to indicate um, this is from 2021, uh, a study of different forest insects in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It was done by folks at the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, and I'm just highlighting the fact that we're accumulating them. <laughs> There's more and more. So this is a gypsy moth. This started in the 80s. They're still present in different patches. Um, the hemlock will lay I think those of you who are out in the forest have seen the impacts there. Uh, the emerald ash borer is something that just came in 2013, right? So we are different. Um, insects are coming into these systems and so we are paying attention to see what impact they may have on uh, stream chemistry and habitat. Okay, so I just, I'm gonna mention something that I think is interesting, um, but it's not conclusive, and that is we have in Shenandoah National Park streams noticed a 
a recent increase in nitrate in some of our streams. So this is what this graph is showing you, not all of them, but some of them. Um, it's actually Piney River, so that's a site in the north, and White Oak Run is also increasing. And we don't actually know why yet. So this is something that the Park Service is aware of, and we're keeping an eye on to see if this pattern increases, to see if we understand, is it tied to some kind of insect? Uh, we don't know yet. But there is also another bit of information that we gathered from the survey that Tom was um, talking about earlier. I mentioned earlier the VTSSS statewide survey. So while we are kind of focusing on the sulfate and the pH and the ANC, we also measured nitrate. And what we saw is that in the northern part of the state, so this is kind of this dividing line, you can see a lot more red up here, we are seeing increases in nitrate. Um, and so that Right, that, that's telling us something's going on. And so the data that we're collecting is providing us information um, and hopefully we'll, we'll figure out what's driving that or seeing if it persists in the future. I'm gonna skip that for now, okay. Okay, so fire. Um, you guys, if you're from this area and lived here back in 2016, might remember the smoke from the Rocky Mountain fire. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about, we were involved in a um, study to look at the impact of that fire on water chemistry, um, specifically mercury. So I know mercury is not something I've really mentioned, but I do want to talk to you briefly about why it um, kind of uh, fits into the context of acid rain. Like, like sulfur and carbon, there is some mercury in coal. It's a very little bit, but it volatilizes just like uh, those other, um, like CO2 and sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. It, it gets transported uh, and then comes down into the system and into the uh, stream, potentially into the fish. You guys know a little bit about that around here, I'm sure, different source. <laughs> so these are much, much lower levels, but um, it's still something that is kind of at a background level uh, in mountain streams in this area. Okay, so this is a big summary here. That's actually the fire back in the end of April 2016. This is a map showing you the fire extent here. And it was actually burned one of the watersheds completely that we monitor a two mile run. And so what we were able to do is get into two mile and start sampling more regularly after the fire and we sampled during high flow in particular, and we looked at basic water chemistry as well as mercury, um, because we knew that mercury is something that is stored in the vegetation, in the soils, and if you burn it, maybe it doesn't just go in the atmosphere, maybe some of it comes right back down uh, or has implications on the stream. And so what we found is summarized in this graph. So this is showing the amount of particulate mercury on the suspended sediment, and so this black line um, sorry, the green line is showing you an unburned watershed, so that's pain run. That's a normal background level. The red line is showing you after the fire, two to eight months. So there was a, there was a large flux, relatively large, um, more than background of particulate mercury that came out of that system probably from redeposition um, or the burned material. So we do know that there is an increase in the amount of mercury that comes downstream after a fire in these systems. So fire we know has other implications. The other water chemistry actually didn't change. Um, we didn't start measuring until a little bit after the, the, um, sorry, the fire came through. We had to set up the site, but, but it was a fairly low severity fire. So the other parameters actually didn't change, but the mercury did. So that was you know, good information to know moving forward. Okay, so this is kind of the end of the talk. I'm not, I don't actually have a watch. I don't know how bad I'm doing here on time. I'm okay, okay. So you may have heard um, that there is going to be a watershed liming. So that's when you dump lime. So basically something that's gonna neutralize the acids in the soils. Um, that's gonna be done on the um, Meadow Run watershed. Uh, it was slated for like a year or two ago, but it keeps getting pushed. So right now I think it's next winter. Um, and so basically Shenandoah National Park 
had a plan to do this watershed restoration, which is typically not something they do, um, but they went through the environmental assessment, which was completed in 2021, and now they have a huge um, summary about how they're gonna move forward. I'm not gonna talk about the details. I did put this link down here if anyone wants to read. Um, they have a really nice storyboard and explanation of what's going on. Um, but I just wanted to let you know what our role is gonna be. Um, so we have, um, oh, sorry, sorry, before I get to that, I just wanted to kind of illustrate what, so where is, we call it VP36, but Meta Run um, is in red here. So it is the site of all the ones we monitor in the park that has the lowest pH. This is from 2022 data, and that you can see that ANC is really close to zero. So that's because the, the bedrock there is even more like weather resistant than, than the other uh, types of bedrock in this region. So, so there we are, there's Meta Run. Um, so yeah, so it is slated for liming. And so we are now monitoring Meadow Run weekly. We've added um, stream flow monitoring and we're doing basic water chemistry monitoring. And so we're gonna try to help answer the question, what is the impact of that liming on the water chemistry? What is the acid neutralizing capacity, the pH, the aluminum, the sulfate? Um, how is that changing over time? And then the park is still doing their fish surveys. They do macroinvertebrate surveys. And so we're all gonna pull this information together to see what uh, the impact of that Lyme application is on the stream and make sure it's doing what they hope it, it uh, what's it intended to do. Um, and I just wanted to mention, you know, a lot of our sites, most of the data I have talked to you about, we measure at the base of the watershed at one location right, it's assuming that everything in here is being represented, um, but we also know fish swim throughout the network, um, and so we also wanna understand how liming impacts not just that downstream location, but throughout the network, and so we're also uh, doing synoptic surveys. We did one this past December, and we will do, uh, do them after the liming as well, so we'll hopefully be able to answer questions about all of the stream habitat. And I won't go to this, I'll leave the summary for people to read later. Um, and then I'll just end with acknowledgements of lots of folks who fund and contributed to the work listed up there and then a pretty little uh, orchid at White Oak Run this past June. So. And that's, that's it. All right, thank you very much, Amy. And we would like to uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions. If you do have a question, just wait for the microphone because we do have an online audience as well. So, Josh. Of course, we got a lot of questions, but, and I noticed you didn't talk about carbonate because you're only dealing with the, uh, the park, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, when you have that episodic, uh, flow, uh, you showed each of the different rock groups, granite, um, basalt, and uh, the sandstone. Um, you had a off, when you showed the graph of the peak of the, uh, of the acidity and the peak of the uh, water, you showed one where you mixed them all together and you, there was an offset there between when the acidity came through and the uh, water, it was a slight off offset. And I'm wondering if that changes with the, uh, with the, uh, um, depending on which row those rock types are, which. Um, the, the offset uh, between like when the peak of the water flows. With that when the acid comes the, through when the acid and how fast it moves through there. Well, on an episodic. On the episodic uh, basis. Um, I don't know if I can answer that right now. As far as differences, I think the timing should be similar, um, but the extreme change in the pH was going to be only occurring at the siliciclastic sites because there's um, because of the little how 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 much less acid neutralizing capacity was present throughout the soil profile there. But I wouldn't want to look at it. I wouldn't want to answer cert with certainty until I, I looked at the data again. No, I wouldn't say either of them last longer. I don't know if anyone's looked at that specifically, but it, we tend to look at it more by flow versus time. Um, 
they tend to recover, from what I recall, fairly similarly. It's more of the what's the change being uh, not as dramatic at the native test site. But that's a good question. I don't. I don't think anyone's like directly looked at timing of recovery. Oh, sorry. Okay. Other, other questions? Yeah, we got one right here. I got two quick questions. One is, uh, I'm sorry. One is, our soil here tends to hold more sulfur, as you mentioned before, compared to the north. Mm -hmm. Is there an estimation that you may be aware of of how long it would take for that to then go down as it is now? Is there a belief in? It, it's pr probably on the uh, tens to hundreds to be totally gone, but we've just in the past 10 years passed the threshold of which there's more coming in than going out. Okay. So that's positive. But the, so we, it, it may in fact start um, improving faster because of that. So we've now depleted all those stores. So we'll hopefully keep measuring to, to track it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's certainly gonna be a ways to go, I would say on the order of decades at least. Okay. The other quick question is, as far as the CO2, you mentioned the concern is the deforestation, deforestation and, and that there's less shading. That was more from uh, defoliations from yes. insects and things like that, yes. yeah. Uh, has there ever been any trial um, of planting around that to try to see if that's something that we, that we could actually diminish that concern in you know, a small area? Uh, like putting, putting in more growth to yes. bring in the... Um, I don't know about that type of habitat restoration. I think there tends to be in where we are talking about like the park wouldn't do that, I don't believe. Um, I think they kind of let nature do its thing, right. although they do they do put insecticide in to try to preserve, I know they've done that for the hemlocks and I'm not sure if they're doing it for the ash. So there's there are some management, um, but that's a good question. I don't know if they try to replant when they know they've lost like their hemlock. I'm shade. not aware of any studies in the park and that kind of headwater system, but certainly down in the Spring Creeks, there's lots of, there have been studies done on Smith Creek in Shenandoah County where they actually shaded the stream and they showed it would do like a two degree difference in stream temperature just from the shading alone. Right, but they, do they reforest stream bank areas? Yeah, reforested the stream that. banks, okay. yep. Yeah. yep. And I know Josh had another question, so I'll give him a chance. When they found the increased mercury on yeah. the particular matter, did they ever, did they find, one, did they find mercury in solution? No, the dissolved fraction did not increase. It, so no. there's a low level, but it did it's, not increase. Yeah, mercury doesn't <laughs> very easily. So, and was there an increase in mercury found in the fish? Nobody studied that. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Normally, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> Couple of questions. One, in just about, isn't mercury an immunological suppressant? And doesn't it start in the food chain in the, in the sediment? It does start in, so methylmercury, when uh, the methylation process, which is the type of mercury that is taken up by biota, um, does the process by which the inorganic that we measured becomes methyl, which can be taken up by fish, does happen in the sediment. So that particulate mercury would have to then be transformed before it would accumulate, yes. Okay. So that, yeah, so just because the inorganic went up doesn't mean it would go up in the fish. It has to be processed. Okay, yeah. okay that answers the question. Second question, we've had some events, and I'm not gonna age myself, uh, nobody laugh. Um, we had some tremendous habitat destruction both in national forest uh, native trout streams and in the park in, in the floods of 69. And if you take, for example, Ramsey's Draft, North and South Fork of Ty River, uh, th they are bare rock still, and that's since 1969. So the whole issue of, of water temperature rise 
in the Crease and Brook Trout, reforestation has to be taken into consideration for restoring the populations. Yeah, yeah, shade, yeah, bringing shade back. Yeah, I didn't talk about, yeah, floods clearing out yeah. the riparian vegetation is gonna have a, yeah, impact. And there are multiple jurisdictions here, National Forest and the Shandor National Park. Do you find that, that that's not an easy issue to bridge if you're looking to, for, as far as restoration? I'm not on the restoration end, so I can't really answer uh, that question. I do know the park, yeah, yeah, it's a question for the park and the Forest Service. We, we work with them, but that's never, I, I haven't been part of that conversation, so I, I couldn't answer it. Tom, have you been part of that conversation? Uh, not so much on the park side, but I do know how difficult it is for them to do something like Meadow Run, which he was suggesting there at the end. Mm -hmm. All the scoping that needs to go into that is, you know, much more rigorous than what we can do outside of the park. This is a good question. I mean, I certainly know there's, they, they have lost a lot of hemlocks, and I don't, I don't remember ever hearing that they would do anything but look and saw what would replace it <laughs> naturally. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, but a, a good question. I have a question about the broader uh, hydrological picture, and mm -hmm. it may be out of your scope, and if so, I understand. But I uh, understand that the brook trout are sort of the canary in the coal mine because it's a sensitive species, and these are pristine mountain streams. But for instance, when you talk about the nitrates being flushed out uh, and the changes in the upper watershed, the high mountain streams, uh, is there any collaboration or is there anybody looking at the warm water fisheries that these streams eventually feed into and that eventually lead ultimately to say to the Chesapeake Bay? Um, and I'm thinking of the rivers that we have in the Shenandoah Valley, like you know the middle, the south, and the uh, Shenandoah. Uh, is there any, you know, what, what can you say about kind of what, when something is happening up here, is there trickle down Right. Uh, or is it just that, you know, the warm water fisheries are kind of dumb fat, you know, <laughs> fish that, that are, you know, you can dump fertilizer in the water and they're barely impacted? Yeah, I can't necessarily speak to that. I would imagine the VDWR now, is it, is it the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, those DWR. folks, DNR, yeah. they, they would um, be the ones to know about the warm water fisheries and the implications. I certainly think the increase in nitrate when we have those defoliations, that, that is not, I mean, that's, that's an increase downstream, and I would think that would have an uh, impact. I'm not sure if the levels are high enough. Yeah, I, um, would, I would argue that those are pretty small levels compared to some of the impacts we have down in the valley bottom, like probably, yeah, they're not on the level of agriculture. Or from wastewater plant yeah. treatment plants, yeah. but not, not, not to be ignored. Yeah. Right, because there's a lot of them, you know, maybe in the bay it, it accumulates to, to contributing something, but um, yeah, it's not it's not on par with an agricultural change, but but yeah, sorry, I don't know too much about once you get out of the cold streams. One more question, maybe, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, I was just wondering about as the CO two is increasing in the atmosphere, is that making the rainwater more? Acidic, because I know you said something about the CO2 that's naturally in the atmosphere does make the rain slightly acidic. Yes. That's so is that a potential issue? That is a very good question, and I don't have the answer for you, except that it, currently it is not having an impact such that the pH, because we measure it in the rainwater, um, but I know that it does impact the acidification of the ocean, but it's not having an impact on like the, the, the rain. And I don't know the chemistry behind that, but that is a really good question that I actually should investigate. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the uh, liming proposal. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little about um, how much of the stream, say in, in miles or Sure. How, how much is expected to be lined and what, uh, what you would hope that the outcome might be? Sure. Um, and you can 
there is a lot more information and research that has gone into that um, project planning than I can speak to. So there's, and it is available online through the park. But my understanding is that they are gonna actually apply it via a helicopter, so a region, not just, like you can actually just lime a stream, like certain miles. But initially they did plan on putting lime throughout the watershed, like the entire watershed. But I believe it's now been scaled back to just um, closer to the main channel and not kind of the far reaches. But that's, it literally is kind of changing, I think, what, what the park is gonna be able to do. And so right now, the last plan I saw maybe had 25% of the watershed being limed, um, kind of more along the stream channel. But I don't, I don't think that's, um, set yet, and the, the idea is that when you, mo you put it in the watershed, it kind of slowly makes its way to the stream, so it's more of a, a longer term solution versus dumping it in the stream, and you might, the, so the Forest Service ha does some like stream application, and they have to keep redoing it and redoing it to kind of, we actually monitor some of those streams, and you can see the pH going down again, and at a certain point, they add more lime to the stream. This is gonna be a kind of a one-time addition, and so the hope is that it becomes, it, it gets um, ingrained into the soil and becomes kind of a longer term um, increase in pH to keep the worst conditions from happening. Great, and please join me one more time in thanking Amy for her presentation tonight. Next month, we'll have a presentation on stormwater and stormwater management. So that's going to reflect a little bit about what she talked about with episodic flows. Look forward to seeing you then.